Friends and colleagues, welcome back to Columbia Business News Recap for the uh, week leading up to Halloween. Happy Halloween. It's October 30th. And just minutes ago, when neighboring Brazil, former President Ignacio Lula da Silva beat uh, current President Jair Bolsonaro. Um, what does that mean for Colombia? Um, Lula is a left-wing president, not like a radical revolutionary, but but he's what you would call a democratic socialist. Um, uh, Bolsonaro has been nicknamed uh, the South American Donald Trump. Um, he certainly uh, is a polarizing figure and kind of does a lot of the same bombastic uh, uh, and controversial. He has the same kind of style, I guess you could say. But um, Lula will certainly get along better with uh, Colombia's new president, um, Gustavo Petro. So maybe some good will come of it and uh, we might see some progress regarding uh, protection of the indigenous population. Um, that's been a, uh, a stain on Bolsonaro's uh, term as president in Brazil. He hasn't been very friendly to them. Uh, combating illegal de deforestation and a protection of the Amazon rainforest that spans both countries. So maybe we'll see some uh, some positive outcomes uh, in those respects. But Colombia and Brazil have, I guess you would call it a cordial but relatively quiet uh, relationship. Um, and I would expect that to continue. Um, we're coming off of a week of protests in Colombia. Last weekend, there were small protests in Cali, Medellin, and Bogota against Petro and his proposed tax reform, uh, calling for the resignation of controversial Minister of Mines and Energy, uh, Irene, Irene Velez, to say her name in English, Irene in Spanish. Um, but uh, there are thousands of workers in the petroleum sector, and some of them participated in the protest, uh, fearing for their future employment. You also had some people that were kind of already predisposed to be um, uh, skeptical of uh, President Petro, some people that may have been uh, politically aligned with his opponents, but then also some legitimate concern from the business and entrepreneurial community uh, that took part in those protests. This past Friday, there were protests um, in Colombia's three largest cities, but by a very different group. The last week's protests were full of business people and petroleum workers. Uh, this weekend, it was a loose movement of uh, called Primera Linea, and that translates as as front line or more literally first line. Um, this is a diverse youth group. Um, to say group is maybe not even quite the right word. It's um, um, a movement, uh, a protest movement. Um, then it contains everything from university students to the disenfranchised and the impoverished. Now, there were violent protests last year during the Ivan Duque administration. Some people blame the protest, well, a lot of people blame the protest on uh, Colombia's notorious ESMAD um, anti-riot police. Uh, and ESMAD has uh, some issues, um, serious issues. issues. Uh, there were cases last year where there were peaceful protests and then ESMAD just came in and started knocking heads. Uh, you have cases of ESMAD going after journalists that happen to be there and innocent bystanders. And, and I remember one case, a kid was just, you know, riding his bicycle down the street and ESMAD went after him. Uh, it's like they show up and just come out and just start attacking. Um, so uh, whatever the case might be, you've got about 20 uh, people arrested uh, that were arrested last year during, during the protest and, and some would say riots or unrest. Uh, and they're still being held, and uh, they're being held for for vandalism and public disorder. Now, here we are a year later, and as an outside observer, there's something odd that I do see in Colombian justice. So these people are detained for vandalism, but haven't yet been prosecuted or sentenced. Now, if you did a crime, if you're tearing up public property or private property, then prosecute the people, and whatever the penalty is, then have them serve the penalty. But they've been detained now. They haven't gone to trial or been sentenced. On the other hand, you have cases like just here last week in Bogota. A lady was captured uh, throwing her baby in the trash. 
and um, neighbors went after her. Uh, she was captured kind of um, in flagrante delicto, as they say, you know, just kind of red-handed, as we would say in English. And um, But she was immediately released by the judge. Even the mayor um, of Bogota, uh, Claudia Lopez, came out um, denouncing wh why uh, the criminals are coddled uh, so much. Um, it's interesting because Claudia Lopez, some would consider her left-wing um progressive, whatever kinds of words you want to use, but she has been clearly frustrated by the insecurity um, and the lenient tr uh, treatment that it appears um, criminal suspects get. And that is an issue. I know of cases here in Colombia where um, it's a real problem where, let's say, a thug steals your cell phone, okay, and then you go and report it, uh, and they catch the thug, and the thug says, I'm going to come and get you for reporting me, or I'm going to have my band or my gang members get after you for this. And they let the guy out, even though, I mean, he's caught, he's caught with your cell phone and they let the guy out. Um, he's not sentenced to anything meaningful. And so now uh, citizens are afraid to report crimes. And that is uh, a real um, civil issue here in Colombia. Now, the peso's fallen. A year ago, it was around 3,800 to the dollar. Now it's about 4,800, over 4,800, actually. I think I checked, and it's 48, uh, just like 4,820, 4,819 to the dollar. That's a huge fall for just um, one year. I think Colombia has the second worst performing currency in the world. Uh, maybe it's not hyperinflation, but it's a real serious problem. Um, Exporters benefit from that, but Colombia does not have a lot of exporters outside of the petroleum sector. There's some agricultural ex exports, but Colombia is not a country that produces uh, in large quantities finished manufactured goods. There's some textile industry, not as much as it used to be, uh, but as far as things like high-tech manufacturing or um, uh, electronics or uh, vehicles, that kind of thing. There's not, uh, there is some of it, but but comparatively speaking, there's quite a little uh, of it in Colombia compared to, say, a place like uh, Mexico or Brazil, even if you take into account the size difference uh, between the economies. Now, you have supply chain issues that are affecting everyone globally. Um, I interviewed, you can read the interview that I did a couple of weeks ago in Manizales with the head of the um, the rum manufacturer, Industria Licorera de, de Caldas, and I spoke with the CEO who told me about the supply chain issues that they're having getting the bottles for packaging their rum. And he told me that the problem is that the glass supplier in Colombia, you have one major supplier of bottles, uh, of bottle glass, you have big manufacturers of, and of like architectural glass, like techno glass, but bottle, the bottle industry and the packaging industry is a whole separate um, setup. And uh, the glass industry is having trouble supplying bottles because they can't get caustic soda, also known as lye or sodium hydroxide. Um, come to find out the lye that they use for production, they were getting from Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine is in the middle of a war right now with Russia. And so they have other issues to deal with, but that has affected the availability of rum on grocery store, grocery store shelves in Colombia because of events happening uh, on the Black Sea over in Eastern Europe. Um, you have Petro's threat of capital controls. So President Petro has, uh, he came out a couple weeks ago and tweeted that he was toying with the idea of, um, of imposing taxes or restrictions on uh, outbound capital flows. That, of course, is a big mistake uh, because when it's hard to get money out of a country, then investors are not going to put money into a country. And the peso already being under pressure, he makes a move like that. And we can see what has happened, unfortunately, in Venezuela to the south. Uh, that doesn't turn out too well. And um, so uh, his uh, finance minister, Ocampo, quickly came out and said, no, we're not going to do something like that, backed by the... Um, head of Colombia's central bank, Banco de la República, but still the damage had been done. The, the idea that the president would even toy with something like that is not going to be good for the peso and not going to be good for uh, foreign direct investment into Colombia. 
Um, Petro has gone after a $100 million loan from the United Nations to buy a land from ranchers and give that land to um, disadvantaged groups and um, ethnic minorities and uh, victims of violence. Now, this is really interesting because the ranchers... Um, I guess you'd call it an industry association or gremio, like they call it in Colombia. Uh, Fedegan is what it's called. It's headed by a guy named Mr. Laforia. I forget his first name, but he is the husband of uh, Maria Fernanda Caval, who is a senator uh, from Cali. And she is kind of an arch uh, political enemy, an avowed anti Petro person, uh, an acolyte, and devotee of uh, former president and senator um, Alvaro Uribe. She's what you would call an Uribista, which would be people that are, you know, followers, political followers and admirers of, of Alvaro Uribe, mostly in his Centro Democratico political party. But this is interesting because Petro has successfully negotiated this deal, it seems, with the Ranchers uh, Federation, and he's going to get this money, this is the plan at least, and give it to the ranchers and buy some of the land from the excess land from the ranchers and then give that land to certain marginalized groups, I guess you would say, um, who also make up um, a lot of his supporters, Petro supporters. And this would be victims of violence and this would be um, indigenous uh, people, uh, certain uh, ethnic Afro-Colombians. Um, displaced people uh but anyway he has a plan to do that and so it's interesting because it's kind of a deal where it's not like a robin hood deal where he's going to go and take from the ranchers and just you know take it away and give it to other people um but he's actually negotiating a voluntary buyback thing which is good to see in the sense of not making a judgment on whether this plan is um uh, i haven't looked into the details and so i don't know but but whether this this um, land, I guess, uh, grant scheme uh, is good. It may be, um, but it's interesting in that how he has uh, come to this deal with the um, the ranchers. Anyway, he has to get a $100 million loan to, to fund this. Now he's going to have to pay that back. So that's a lot of money for an economy the size of Colombia. Not a huge amount of money, but it's a significant amount of money. And Petro has to think about how he's going to pay this back. So the country already is facing um, current account struggles and budget deficits. And that's why there's a tax reform on the table. People are protesting the tax reform. He wants to go and get more money from mining. He wants to go and get more money from the petroleum sector. Uh, there's a lot of other business sectors that are concerned um, as well. And there have been protests already against his tax reform. Um, and so how is he going to get the money to pay for all of this? Now, investors are going to look at this and say, uh, and this is going to put further downward pressure on the peso as there is uncertainty um, with whether Colombia can maintain uh, budgetary discipline during the Petro administration. Maybe so, uh, but for right now there is uncertainty and that's causing downward pressure on, on the peso as well. Petro has also said he wants to look at renegotiating um, some of Colombia's 13 free trade agreements. Now, right now, Colombia not being a country that produces uh, finished consumer goods uh, or even like industrial high-tech B2B goods like cell phones or computers or technology or um, uh, vehicles or something like that, uh, Colombia has to import these products. And so even though those products come in at favorable tariffs, Colombia is able to export whatever products it does produce agriculture, you do have some industrial uh, champions, companies like Technoglass that makes um, glass and aluminum products, um, other companies uh, that export products. But the point is that um, renegotiating those, if you take away those um, and all of a sudden consumer goods become more expensive, well, uh, and, and those uh, and those trade flows become less favorable, that's also going to put down the pressure on the peso. And I think that all of these different things that we've just talked about are ingredients into why we see the peso uh, where it is. Interest rates and different things like that, obviously there's a relationship between the peso and the dollar. And in the U.S., um, 
interest rates have gone up to combat inflation, um, but uh, and interest rates have gone up here in Colombia as well. I think they're at uh, the bank raised the rates to something like 11 percent. Uh, be sure to read um, Rupert uh, Stebbing's column uh, republished in Finance Columbia called uh, What Jumps Out, uh, where he as an economist um, and as somebody with a relationship with the uh, Colombian stock market has a lot of insight on this and he publishes every week. But anyway, uh, Colombia's state-controlled petroleum giant Ecopetrol faces an uncertain future. The company trades with the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol EC, but 88% of the shares are owned by the Colombian government. The giant question is how will a, an anti-petroleum president manage or handle a, the petroleum giant Ecopetrol over the next four years, seeing that Ecopetrol is the singus, single biggest contributor to uh, state revenues, to government revenues, um, and the single biggest earner of uh, foreign exchange as a petroleum exporter. So that's going to be something interesting to watch. And, and, and Petro needs a profitable Echo Petro to feed his amb ambitious social agenda and to pay for uh, Colombia's worrying levels of sovereign debt. But Petro was explicit about wanting to kill off the petroleum industry over the long term and has pledged no new production or exploration permits under his administration. So this is something to watch closely. I'm speaking of this, last Monday, a new board of directors was ratified and Carlos Gustavo Cano was elected chairman of Ecopetrol, but less than a day later, he was booted from the position and replaced by Saul Catan. What's going on here? Um, that's not a good look for a publicly traded company with a $20 billion market capitalization. You don't like to see this kind of behavior um, and uncertainty uh, when you're looking at a company that's uh, got um, billions of dollars of uh, investor holdings out there, and that's so important to Colombia's um, economy. <clears throat> Nothing against Saul Catan. He ran Bogotá's uh, telecommunications company, ETB, um, ETB in English, uh, Empresas Telefónicas de Bogotá, when President Petro was the mayor of Bogota. So it appears that Petro wanted to install someone who is close to him, or at least someone he has a relationship with uh, as the chairman of Echo Petro. Uh, still, what happened between Monday and Tuesday? That's that's kind of an odd thing. Um, Catan was capable as far as, um, as I remember with Etebe. Uh, I was an Etebe customer um, when uh, he was, um, running the organization, the telecom, the phone system has worked uh, fine when I lived in Bogota. Um, and actually, I continue to be an Etebe customer. And um, their customer service is horrible, but um, the phone tends to stay on. They have, of course, roaming agreements and infrastructure sharing agreements with other telecoms. Um, but uh, Catan has been long gone from, from Etebe. And so um, it will be interesting to see uh, how things play out there with the relationship between um, President Petro and the petroleum giant Echo Petrol. Moving to Medellin, there is drama and tension at the city-owned utility EPM. Uh, EPM in English, uh, EPM is Empresas Publicas de Medellin. And EPM is an interesting company because it is, uh, it runs under normal circumstances like a private uh, conglomerate like a private like private enterprise Etebe owns assets throughout Colombia um, they run uh, electrical and uh, public utility operations uh, and not you know far away from Medellin um, they run electric what used to be electric Caribe uh, in Cartagena they have assets outside of Colombia the waterworks in Antofagasta Chile are owned by FAM. They have some assets, I believe, in, in Panama and Central America. So it's really interesting. Uh, it's a really an interesting business setup. Um, and normally it has been run at arm's length from the city political administration. Um, the, the mayor of Medellin has a seat and is generally the, their chairman of the board of FAM because Medellin, the city of, of Medellin, is the sole shareholder and owns 100% of FAM. Now, why that's important internationally is because FAM does have debt 
on um, international capital markets. So it has ratings with the ratingness agency, and uh, there is international investment in FAME, not not in the form of, of shares, but in the form of um, foreign debt that's backed by the city of Medellin. Now, FAM has this big, giant hydroelectric uh, project called Hidroituango. Hydroituango, it's a hydroelectric dam. It's supposed to generate, uh, when finished, 2.4 gigawatts of uh, electricity, which is enough to provide, uh, according to projections, about 17% of Colombia's total energy, uh, electricity needs, uh, let's say in the year 2026. And practically everyone is pulling for the hydroelectric project to be a success. Um, I can think of one outspoken detractor who's a like a environmental and um, activist who uh, insists that the whole project be torn down and uh, it's like a five billion dollar project I think and and but you know nobody's listening to her so um, there's no real opposition to the Hidroituango project and uh, people here uh, need it especially in Medellin because it's so integral to um, to the balance sheet of um, of APM and also the city. So, but Medellin Mayor Daniel Quintero has politicized the project and, and inserted it firmly into his populist narrative. Um, now, Quintero, even from his campaign for mayor in 2019, uh, set out to demonize the construction consortium building the dam. And after taking control of EPM as mayor, instructed them, instructed EPM to rebid the construction, disrupting the construction schedule and pretty much going to war with the um, the consortium that is building the the dam. Now, the current contract expires December 1st uh, and the dam is not finished. Uh, the superstructure um is built like the actual dam that holds the water back is built and the spillway is operational but the dam is supposed to have eight turbines uh electrical turbines that generate the hydroelectric energy and none are operational and only two were physically installed uh, you have you know there's like a couple there's the holes are there for turbines three and four but they're not even in the holes and the concrete hasn't even been poured um turbine one is looks like it's close to uh, being able to be spun up. Um, turbine two is still being uh, installed as of a month ago. Uh, the last four, the construction really hasn't even begun. So the the, the dam, if you go to uh, the Rio Calca, the Calca River, and you'll see the dam there, and you'll see water, and from the outside the dam, well, it looks it looks great, but inside the construction is still continuing, and it's way behind schedule now. It got put behind schedule because of a near catastrophe that happened in 2018 when uh, the river Kauka was, um, I guess it had reached flood stage um, or was nearing flood stage. And uh, there was a diversion tunnel. There are several. I think there's three, but uh, there may be more. But anyway, one of them collapsed uh, and it collapsed, as it turns out, due to a design flaw. And that caused a chain reaction of events that put the dam itself in danger and to save the dam and also to prevent a catastrophe because if that dam broke, Rio Cauca is the second largest river in Colombia and it's a big dangerous river. Uh, it could have put uh, 20,000 lives at risk downstream, maybe even more. But anyway, so to save the, the dam, they had to flood the chamber, the subterranean, it's underneath the mountain chamber where the turbines had been installed they were, it was almost finished and the turbines were, uh, a lot of the machinery uh, and super expensive things like the transformers. And these are huge high voltage transformers that come in. I think they have Siemens transformers. Well, all of this got destroyed because they had to flood that chamber to relieve pressure on the dam and to provide an alternate flow for the river. Uh, but then that damaged everything and it caused, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. Um, it also caused cost in the lack of energy production because they were supposed to be producing energy. Uh, so EPM had to pay a fine because of that. Plus, um, everything had to be re-engineered. Um, more turbines and transformers and things had to be ordered. They had to figure out how to recover from all of this flood damage. 
that it happened. Um, and again, all of this is underground. But anyway, um, uh, so there's a lot of things that caused uh, certain delays. But then when Quintero took office, he disrupted the construction schedule. Uh, he told uh, he ordered APM to rebid the construction. He wanted to throw out the existing um, construction consortium. Now, I used to be in insurance and bonding and insurance, uh, especially when you look at things like construction bonds. One of the things you learn is that it's extremely expensive to have to change contractors. Let's say you have a contractor and you're going to build a skyscraper or something like that. And um, the contractor fails. Either they don't know what they're doing technically or maybe they become insolvent and then you have to replace the contractor. Uh, the bond, the bonding company, which is bonds or type of insurance that you can get to ensure that a project is completed. And what happens is if the, the so when you see like on um, in the U.S., you'll see a truck and you'll see a plumber and it says licensed and bonded. Well, bonded means that he has a bond and that if he starts a project and can't finish it or she, uh, then the bonding company will come in and pay to make sure that the project is completed. Um, and what happens is when you change, uh, you want to avoid changing contractors if possible. Now, if something goes wrong and you need to have litigation and you need to work something out after the fact, it's still ideal, uh, even if you're the plaintiff, to um, get the project done and then go and try to recuperate damages. But no, um, he came in there and wants to throw out uh, the consortium, which is CCCI, it's um, Consortium Construction Something They Eat to Ongo. Um, but anyway, now the current contract expires December 1st, and after postponing the tender process four times, this is um, the uh, Quintero administration and his um, his uh, underlings uh, that he has installed in EPM, there's no certainty as to who's going to finish the construction. Okay, there's not it's not even a quarter of the way. Now, the dam is more or less finished, but inside the hydroelectric part, the part that generates electricity is the part that's not finished, okay? And so right now, not one of the eight turbines are generating electricity. Only two are even installed in a physical sense. That's to say, if you go there and look, which I did, uh, there's a turbine in the hole, okay? And then the other, there's two more holes where they're still pouring concrete and there's no turbines. And then there's four more that they haven't even begun the process yet. So it's not even a quarter of the way done. Um, and um, I've spoke to uh, Olga Lucia Arango, who is the, the president of CINPRO, EPM's largest union. And according to her, she says that, that uh, Quintero seeks to bring in a Chinese firm to complete the work. I spoke to a source inside of uh, FAM who did confirm to me, EPM, who did confirm to me that there is a Chinese entity participating in Quintero's rebidding process. Again, that process has been delayed like there. So you have the the um the tender the public tender and that says okay we invite potential contractors to bid on this project and there's a deadline it's a public work so everything has to be is supposed to be um kind of transparent and to be fair here's the date that that all the bids and the proposals have to be submitted by well that date came and went and so they changed it then they, they changed it again and uh why it sounds like it was at the request of one of the potential bidders, um, which is kind of not illegal, but abnormal, because the whole reason you have this this uh, process is to be fair to everybody. And so when one comes in there and says, well, can I get more time? Well, in a certain way, that's unfair to the others. But anyway, um, so um, uh, if Idroi Tuango, if this dam is not feeding electricity into Columbia's national electrical grid by the end of November, EPM faces a $170 million fine. Uh, for comparison, the national government is looking for $100 million to, do, to and, and they're going to borrow the money uh, to do this land um, redistribution deal that they're working on that I just spoke about. So besides the $170 million fine that EPM and Medellin as EPM's owner will owe uh, the national government for not providing this electricity, by the end of November, um, there is a firm energy obligation. Now, what happens is that, so this dam is under construction, and you can buy electricity or commodities also work this way um, on a contract basis or on the spot market. So let's suppose I want to go out right now and buy a trainload of 
soybeans, okay? Then I can look and see what the Chicago Board of Trade um, has for uh, soybean spot prices, okay? And that's how much the soybean cost me per ton or per train load or whatever the, the, the quantity is. And that's what I can pay and I can get my soybeans. Or I can enter into, an, enter into a contract and say, I need X amount. Of, now, why would you do this? Maybe I'm, um, who uses soybeans? Uh, I'm a big food manufacturer or for cattle feed or something like that. And if I think the prices of soybeans are going to be higher, let's say next July, then I can lock in a price now and I can pre-purchase or I can I can also use derivatives like options and futures to do this. But I can pre-purchase um, uh, a certain amount of tons of soybeans. And this works for petroleum. This works for uh, airplane um fuel either either jet a which is basically kerosene which is what jet uh jets run on or you can do avgas which is what piston engine planes run on or you could do this for diesel or, or fuel oil or anything but basically then if you think the price is going to be higher then you can lock in prices now uh and if you do that maybe you lock in prices at a lower rate uh than what they actually are in the future there are also ways that you can um, take steps if you think the price is going to be lower too. You can, um, I don't want to go off on a tangent on how derivatives work, but there are ways to do that. But basically, so EPM has promised the um, the National Electrical Grid of Columbia that, yeah, we promise we're going to have uh, all this electricity online for you by the end of November uh, 2022. They made this deal several years ago. And if they don't, then not only do they have to pay the fine, but they have to make the national grid whole for the electricity that they didn't have to go out and buy on the spot market. Now, remember, aside from that being more expensive, usually sometimes it's cheaper. The peso has been falling. You've got a big uh, crisis right now with the de devaluation. So everything is going to be exacerbated. And so these firm energy obligations are 5.7 trillion pesos. Um, or about 990 million U.S. dollars right now, uh, and the peso continues to fall. So these obligations can reach, uh, can exceed 1 billion U.S. dollars. And I can tell you that the city of Medellin uh, and EPM does not have this kind of extra money laying on hand to just pay out in fines because this dam isn't finished. Now, you can draw a straight line of causality between the political machinations and the exacerbation of the problems that uh, EPM and Idro Duango are having uh, right now. So um, after taking over the project, the mayor first said that Idro Duango would generate electricity on his birthday, supposedly an auspicious date, I suppose, but July 26th. Uh, he said that back in, fe in February. Uh, I will put the link to that conversation. It wasn't with me. Um, we've asked for interviews with the mayor several times. Uh, we did get to speak to him briefly once um, as part of a press pool. Uh, but he has never accepted them. Uh, but anyway, um, he, uh, the mayor said back in February that uh, Idrit Tuanga would generate electricity on his birthday, July 26th. That didn't happen. Then he said October 15th. That didn't happen. So now his credibility is you say something's going to happen and it doesn't happen. Okay, he didn't say, um, well, it depends on a lot of factors and we don't know. And it's a complex situation. No, he said it's going to be generating electricity. So now he has both politicized and personalized this project and is facing dire consequences, feeling the heat and obviously frustrated. The mayor's lashing out at whoever uh, in his imagination wants Idrui Tuango to fail. Uh, on October 11th, he sent a tweet saying, and I translate here, the rats want Idrui Tuango to fall, that we run like them, that we change designs and do things poorly to equalize our luck with theirs. Ijeri Tuango will only start when the last test tells us that everything is good for the project and the people. Now, who was Quintero? It was Quintero that came in and ran off the contractors. So who exactly is he referring to? Okay, as an EPM customer and rate payer, uh, I certainly hope that Ijeri Tuango is a success for consumers, for Medellin, uh, for Colombia and for the international investors that have backed the project. Thanks. Uh, happy Halloween and uh, some cool events that um, we're going to be attending. Most of them uh, mentioned here. I think actually all of them. Uh, so hope to see you there. So the first one that I want to mention is uh, CGS Medellin. It used to be called Colombia Gold Summit. 
Um, it is November 8th and 9th at the Hotel Intercontinental in Medellin. A uh, great event I try to attend every year. This year I will be presenting. Uh, I'll be speaking about the investment panorama for mining technology. Uh, if you're there and if you uh, listen to this, please uh, take the time to say hi to me. I really would appreciate it. I, I want to know that we're reaching people. Um, but anyway, uh, I highly recommend uh, attendance of the Columbia Gold Summit, where not just gold mining, but also copper mining and silver mining are discussed. It brings together people from the investment and finance side with those on the operations and exploration side. Um, there's also some talk usually about uh, ESG, environmental, uh, social, and governance, as well as um, precious, as not just precious metals, but but rare earths as well. There's some rare earth mining activities taking place in Colombia now. Um, and so it is really the best symposium for the precious metals mining uh, sector in Colombia. And I'll be there and I hope to see you there as well. We also have uh, one of my favorites, the Miami Rum Renaissance. This is not in Colombia, but Colombia is a Caribbean country. It is a sugarcane producing country and it is a rum producing country and some of Colombia's uh, distillers will be present at the event. I have been attending for over a decade. This is a great event uh, that's put on. Uh, it kind of was on hiatus a couple years because of the pandemic, but it's back and I'm super excited about that. It's going to be November 12th and 13th uh, in Miami in Coral Gables. And uh, the first day, the 12th, is going to be it's really an academic track and they have lectures and they're bringing in people, uh, experts from around the Caribbean, different uh, uh, distillers and, and the mixers um, and uh, the blenders. And then also some distillery owners who are really going to talk about some of the uh, different topics in the production of rum uh, and from kind of a, a high level standpoint, really for those that are either uh, super interested or even in the business. And then the 13th on Sunday is the day where there's the tasting and the expo exposition. The first two hours of the event are for trade only, uh, but then at 2.30 the doors open uh, to the general public. Make sure you get your ticket in advance. Uh, there is a limited capacity uh, and it's just a great event. So if you are uh, in Miami or like me, uh, find it worthwhile to travel there, um, that's a great event that uh, we always try to partner with them and support them. Uh, and that's the Miami Rum Renaissance, November 12th and 13th. Um, Sergio Guzman is the founder of uh, Columbia Risk Analysis. And it's kind of a political risk consulting firm that focuses on Columbia for investors and executives and politicians and, and um, civil society groups like uh, nonprofit organizations and things like that. And he will be flying to Medellin to uh, give a breakfast talk at an event organized by Medellin Global. Medellin Global is organized by um, another great Sergio, Sergio Escobar, who's a friend of mine uh, as well. And uh, he's a former diplomat. Uh, he's still involved in some bilateral uh, cultural exchange things between Colombia and Brazil. But that event's going to take place in Medellin um, on the 9th. Uh, I believe it's free, but you must pre-register. And to do that, visit the website of Medellin Global, which is simply medellinglobal.org. Uh, moving on, the Clean Tech Show, which is about uh, technology used in the maintenance and upkeep of buildings and facilities, is going to be co-located with the Techno Edificio Show, which is about smart buildings. And that's going to take place in Medellin the 22nd and 23rd at the Hotel Intercontinental. Uh, so that's another great event. The people that organize it do first class events. They just uh, did the Techno Multimedia event uh, in Bogota, which is kind of like the South American version of NAB uh, up in the States, which is for the, would bring, it brings the broadcast industry, the multimedia industry, uh, audio visual industry all together um, in one venue. Now, another event I will be in attendance, I hope to see you there as well for the financial sector, is Bonds and Loans. This is probably 
Finance Columbia's single longest partnership. And uh, GFC Media out of the UK uh, does this event every year. And it started in Bogota. They moved it to Miami because Columbia was still locked down during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, it went very well. But it's going to be at the Ritz-Carlton. So Bonds and Loans Latin America and the Caribbean, it used to be called Bonds, Loans, and Derivatives. Uh, but that's a mouthful. So I'm sure they still talk about derivatives at the event, but just to shorten the name. Uh, it's going to be at the end of the month, November 29th and 30th, at the Ritz-Carlton in Coconut Grove in Miami. We have a discount code. It's a pretty significant discount. I think it's 20%. Uh, but if you um, want to attend, I'll, I'll share the information with you, but use discount code FC20. And again, if you're there, uh, look me up and uh, and say hi. I'd love to see you. And um, And also, let us know if there's something that we should be talking about and we're not, then please let us know about it um, and, and, and share and let us know what you want to hear about. Again, thank you. Uh, you know that how important it is to, to not just like, but subscribe, uh, tell a friend and, um, and please leave a comment. Give me, let, give me your feedback. Let me know um, that you're out there and that you're paying attention. And even if it's some constructive criticism, we want to make this relevant for you, the listener, uh, for you, the viewer. And thanks again. So until next time, stay safe. This is Lauren Moss signing out for Finance Columbia and the Columbus Business News Recap for the week of October 20th. Uh, no, October 30th. That's Halloween. Happy Halloween. At the Viva Foundation, we are convinced that we all aboard the same flight, united in our differences. We believe in education as the route to closing the current poverty gap and towards its eventual extension. We believe that inclusion is the route that provides opportunities for all, regardless of social, economic, or cultural differences. We believe in caring for the biodiversity as the route towards protecting the ecosystems that are the basis of life on this planet. Flying differently make us feel alive. Landing with opportunities make us the Viva Foundation the first and only airline foundation in Colombia, committed to helping those who wish to reach higher.